I'll never forget, uh, I was in a prayer meeting uh, at our church when we first got started. And, uh, and, you know, at that time, it was no men at our church. You know, the statistics are uh, true in many regards where they say that, you know, again, the majority of individuals who come to church are women. And so especially in like men might pop up on a Sunday or whatever, but when it comes to the idea of doing extracurricular things in church, uh, you know, especially like prayer meeting and stuff like that, it's very rare. It's usually the women that gather and pray. And that's just kind of a, a pervasive uh, practice across the, the idea of church um, and a thought. You know, and I'm excited. I mean, I love the fact that that is no longer uh, the landscape of our church. Can we celebrate that God has sent incredible godly men that pray, that prophesy, that pastor, come on, that do incredible stuff in the community, come on, that are outstanding individuals. I just, I love it and I'm so grateful uh, to see them and to, that my sons are, you know, I'm not the only one that they're going to look up to. They have other men of God and men that are pursuing God that they can look up to and be inspired by. That's the way church is supposed to be. But in this prayer meeting, man, I'm sitting there surrounded by all these women in our church. Wifey was there too. Amen. <laughs> I always have to make those things clear. And so I'm sitting there. We are in this prayer meeting. And I will never forget you know, these women at this point in time, uh, one of them gets, starts to pray and she's like, Lord, she, I never forget this. She's like, Lord, send us the men that they can lead us, right? And I am like, I'm peeking my eye around. I'm like, did she just say, send us the men? And then the rest of them begun to pray in that prayer meeting. They're like, God, they are crying out for mandem. Where are the men? To lead us. And really and truly this is echoing the sentiments of many women everywhere. Not just in a romantic sense. But even in, in a sense of an example. Are y'all going to stay with me? An example in terms of in an exemplary sense. The fact that it is necessary. Church is not just for women. God doesn't just want to have relationship with women alone he is desirous of men being in fellowship and in relationship with him being signposts being covers come on somebody leading the way in many regards i know this ain't popular in this time that we live in but i don't care i'm not interested in being popular come on how many of you know chivalry is not dead come on somebody that there are still people out here that are desirous of being godly. But there is a cry for the sons of God and for men of God to be in relationship with God. And to get to a place where they come from the sides and uh, outskirts and, uh, and get to where they need to be. I just, you know, the, the fact of the matter is with this in mind, my desire, I, I believe even at Serve City it was a few months ago. And yeah, I spoke about this because it was just so incredible to me. We were, you know, worship team was up here going, just going hard, fam. And they were crying out the name Jesus. And I remember looking at the back and seeing uh, Damien and Deacon PG and I believe Perrion and some of these others just back there jumping, men jumping in the back yelling, Jesus! Jesus I love it. every time I look out the corner of my eye I see Paul over there going absolutely bonkers if you're not hearing nobody singing you're hearing Paul if ain't nobody dancing I don't care he's like pastor I'm not letting you dance by yourself you see what I'm saying people like pastor Leon that lead the charge with our mandem ministry and do such an incredible job I just love it and the thing that blessed my life can I just brag on the men? I mean, like, my, my son, Gabe, he was up here serving like he usually does, like he's here today. And I'll never forget, when I went back there to jump with them, and Gabe runs back there too. And he jumps in the middle of the crowd talking about, Jesus! Jesus! And I'm like, look how incredible this is. This is what I want my sons to be patterning their lives after. I want them to be able to see godly men that don't have it all together. Come on.
on somebody but no to call on the name of Jesus is there anybody in this place that understand I want my daughter to be able to see godly men that don't have it all together and she don't have to go to the world or to these treacherous hip hop songs to be able to determine how she should be treated because she has examples in the house of God and the men This is why the call, the, no, 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 Newsflash Church is not just for women. Church is for men. And God is calling upon us to take our place and to get where we need to be. I'm telling you, a lot of the attack and the things that are happening on the church of God are because the men will not take their place and stand up. Am I allowed to talk today? Because look. With this in mind, that little prayer meeting, these examples, why is it this way? What, you know, I mean, when you think about it, just let's look at the beginning of time. And I won't be before you long, but I want us to grab these things. In the beginning, in the book of Genesis, the fact of the matter is, I need you to understand that faith, first of all, comes through the word of God. It's Romans 10, 17 lets us know that faith comes by hearing. Somebody say hearing. Hearing. hearing through the word of God. So faith comes through hearing. Faith in God comes through hearing. And then he goes on and he says, how on earth are they going to hear unless there's a preacher? Right. right? And so faith comes through preaching. Not just talking about this stuff up here. Not just talking about me standing up here and yelling at y'all for 30 to 40 minutes on a Sunday. This is included. But preaching happens all the time. Oh, y'all going to stay with me. Can I tell you this? Uh, that not only this, not only does faith come through preaching, but so does folly. So does fear. So does frustration. Comes through, through preaching. Uh, and so, so it's, what is being declared this is often deter what determines what is being practiced. Are you with me? So let me tell you this. Uh, there are, even though you're hearing many voices, there are only two people that are preaching in this world. I've been preaching from the beginning of time. God was preaching since Genesis chapter 1. If you go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, uh, it's about 10 times that you will see God said, He's been preaching. He's been prophesying from the beginning of time. God said, let there be. God said, God declares what things are. Yeah. He says, he declares, he preaches from the beginning of time. Not just to nature, not just to darkness, but he also preaches to man and woman. In fact, if you will, uh, the purpose, watch this. Uh, this, is, this is the first, God preaches the first sermon about purpose to Adam and Eve. Right. Oh, are y'all going to stay with me? Yeah. So look, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and I'm going to go quickly, 28 through 30, Bible says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves. Notice, God blessed them and he says to them, God preaches to them. And preaches an empowering word, telling them what their purpose is to be. And God says, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth. Every tree uh, with seed in it, you shall have them for food. And every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so there, he declares, all the vegans are like, amen. But there in this text, he makes it clear, he declares to them what their purpose is, to be fruitful and to multiply. And most of us think when we hear that, that he's speaking exclusively about childbearing. But notice he gave them seed, not just in their body, but in the environment. And so the purpose of man and woman is to multiply everything that God has given you charge over. And many of you, watch this, many of you are missing your purpose because you're not realizing the purpose that was preached to you from the beginning of time. 
What has God put in your hand, man? What has God put in your hand, woman? It is your responsibility not to complain about it, but to take it and find a way to plant or invest it so that it multiplies. There are millionaires in here right now with $5 in your bank account. Oh, am I, I just I just felt that. that I just felt that all the way in my tippy toes come on somebody there is somebody with an idea that you got to be able to go and take that money and incorporate your business and God will put the fire under your seat that is necessary open the doors that are necessary to position you to create generational wealth beyond your imagination if you'd ask him what do you desire for me to do with this seed so it's not just parental multiplication, uh, but can I even just stand here and declare to someone who is trying to have a child? I just want to declare it today because God has done way too many miracle stories of people who are desirous of children. Come on. And the, the, the stories are countless in our church. Come on. And I just declare to every barren womb, even where the doctor has said no, God, would you touch? Would you do a miracle, Lord? Lord, we ask you, you're able to do it. Uh, you are able to do it. Lord, we ask that you do miracles in Jesus' name. Okay, see, so every, every now, even, if, even if a miracle is a side note, it's still a miracle. Glory to God. But I love this because he calls us to multiply everything, not just parentally, uh, but everything that is under our hand. But God continues to preach. Uh, he says, he says um, let there be. He says, it's God saying, God is declaring, he is preaching. Uh, and then, you know, what, what happens now is uh, in, in, chapter, in chapter one, we have this summary. God says, let us, like we talked about with the Trinity last Sunday, and he says, let us make man. And then he talks about how he made them. And then he declares the purpose. So Genesis chapter 2, uh, we learn about God taking a rest. But then, or resting or ceasing from his work. But then we do a little bit more of a zoom in. So we go in like that was kind of high level in chapter 1. But then now we go kind of zoom in. And he talks about uh, creation of mankind. And the things that he says to mankind. So first he preaches a sermon about, uh, about their purpose to them. But then he goes in and before Eve is created, he talks about a sermon that he preaches to Adam. Oh, can I just break this thing down? So he preaches the first sermon on boundaries and limits, not to the both of them. But he preaches this first sermon on boundaries when we take a zoom in to Adam. How do I notice how the boundaries, limits and consequences here, here, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Are y'all still tracking with me? Yeah. Look, Bible says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden. He took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So there we find that God gives, preaches this sermon to Adam. And how do I know that he speaks, is it, he speaks it to Adam before Eve is created? Be created because chronologically, no perfect people allowed. Verse 18, the very next verse says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So God communicates these boundaries and all of this to the man and then he creates the woman. And so the woman, the man is responsible for not only covering but communicating. So now this is this first, first part of this first uh, evidence of discipleship that we see happening. I, I, I'm just losing my mind on this stuff up here because look, so so the, the priest of the home gets the message from God. That's right. And then in that moment, he is responsible for communicating it to his bride. Who God takes not from under him, but from his rib, from his side. But then look, not only is God preaching to man. I told you it's two preachers. I don't care how many voices you hear, but there are two preachers. Second preacher is Satan. 
And not only is, is, is God preaching, but the devil has been preaching to mankind from the beginning as well. He is the prince of the power of the air. Come on. And he uses the airwaves. He uses the media. He uses so much to put out his lies as his pulpit to deceive mankind. So they have dominion. They are in the place that God desires for them to be. They get this message on purpose. Ooh, what would it have been like to hear God preach? I mean, to hear the triune God declare to the first man and the first woman these things that he did. He not only gives, he gives them together purpose, but he tells the man this boundary. I think this is powerful because it's indicative of man covering and caring for when harm or when uh, limits and all these things take place. But watch, peep this. Satan's been preaching. Uh, and so now when we go to chapter 3, what chapter did I say? Chapter 3 of Genesis, now we see Satan beginning to preach. I want to break a couple things down, and then I want us, then, then we're going to get out here. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Bible says, Now the serpent, so Satan is present in a serpent, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Serpent is crafty. Back then they believed that serpents had wings, and it was just a very uh, interesting creature. It wasn't like how it was cursed to its belly. Because of its sin, it used to be able to fly as, they, as, as uh, commentators would believe. And so watch this. He said to the woman. So God says, let there be. God tells them what is to happen. And now Satan shows up and he says to the woman. Here it is. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So remember, God sets the limit. He tells them in Genesis chapter 2. Did I even read that? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, he puts him in the garden. I did read that, right? Yes. And so he says, if you eat from that. So then now, Satan shows up and he questions Eve on what it is that God said. Can I tell you, here's a point for you. Satan's sermons make you second guess what God said. Fick it, fick it. That's good enough to say again. Satan's sermons make you second guess what God did God really say that you are X, Y, and Z? Come on, somebody. He's been preaching. He started preaching. This is where it begun. He he gets to Eve. He gets to Eve and he asks her this question. His sermons get you to second guess what it is that God has said over your life. What? Can I just make it practical practical for two seconds? What is it that God has called you to do or he has said over your life? Come on. That Satan has been calling you to second guess that he's been preaching to you through the media? Come on. There are also, listen, I'm all for equality. I'm all for being kind to everyone. But can I tell somebody that I am not for the agenda of the enemy to suggest and to put stuff in the minds of people that were not there in the first place until you suggested it. Oh, y'all don't like this type of preaching. When I show up on my computer and I didn't put something on there and I look on the computer and the taskbar is all sorts of colors and I never asked for it to be. There is an agenda. Oh, I'm going to stand flat footed today. The devil is a liar. He's been lying to us from the beginning of time. Come on, somebody. And it's imperative for us not to second guess what God has said. So he says, did, did God actually say that you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. So this is how we know that Adam did a good job of communicating. Because she is able to reiterate She's not just chauvinist. He wasn't just chauvinist and just running around talking great. No, but she actually got it and she understood. She was able to reiterate what it was that Adam had declared. Are you with me? And God had told them. But it's crazy because she makes it clear. She knows where she is. Uh, but the fact is that, that the devil's sermons are made to make you second guess. But watch this. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil's sermons, here we go, Satan's sermons are soaked in semantics. So watch, not only do Satan's sermons cause you to second guess what God said, but Satan's sermons, watch, also are soaked in semantics. In other words, it's, 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 he, it, it, he tries to make things more complex. No, God meant what he said. Right. But oftentimes, he'll, he'll try to get you to the place where you start looking at things uh, that used to be clear differently. Or saying stuff that tricks you uh, out of what it is that God has promised you using semantics. Because yes, their eyes would be open, but they were not going to become God and they were not going to, they were not going to live because God did say you are going to die. Their eyes would be open, but they were going to die. And look, I want you to peep this because Joseph, there's a guy named Joseph. Everybody say Joseph. Joseph and his waist brothers, uh, they threw him in a pit and they sold him into slavery, uh, but they still couldn't kick the favor off his life. And so even when he gets sold into slavery, he moves himself up to an incredible position in his master's house. And then while he is in his master's house, it's amazing what happens. He is he, everything is left in his charge. But then his master's wife. Bible says, verse 6 of Genesis, uh, of Genesis chapter 39 says, So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, so he was a sweeter man. And after a time, his master's wife, preaching from out of bounds. Come here and get these drawers. The master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and says, lie with me. She's out here set in a thirst trap, last name Fatiana, and she's like, come through. But look at what, because Joseph understands the boundaries that have been preached. Come on, somebody. He says, no fam, you're out of bounds. Says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in, in, um, in the house. He says, I have responsibility. He says, and I have put everything that he has put everything that he has in my charge. Verse nine, he is not greater than in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. The devil sermon watch this got Adam and Eve to forget all that they had access to to leave all of that to go and focus in on this one tree in a huge garden Joseph is like I have access to everything I got power I don't need your sketty tail come on somebody to take me away from all of this I wonder who I'm talking to I'm not just talking to the men in the house on today but can I talk to the women there are some men that the devil is using to preach he's preaching from out of bounds trying to call you across the line thinking that if you cross that line it's going to be better on the other side but on the other side is death Death to marriages, death to relationships, come on, death to purpose, death to finances. And every time he tries to make you think that it's going to end different than the last guy, he is succeeding in seducing you into death. Are you with me? It says, and she has spoke to Joseph day by day. Ooh-wee. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house, she's like, I'm going to get him, fam to do his work and none of the men in the house were there she caught him by his garment saying lie with me watch joseph but he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out the house i don't know if we ever peeped that before left his garment in the hand and fled out the house and as soon as she saw he had left the garment in her hand and fled out the house she called the men and just starts lying on them peep this on the him he leaves the garment in the house he flees naked because, watch this, 
he is not as concerned with the shame of running out naked. He says, I will run away and I'll run out naked as long as I'm leaving clothed in my integrity. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to today. The devil's been trying to call you across the boundary line. Come on, man, them or woman, them. I want to tell you on today that you might leave strip of some stuff. You might have to leave some things behind, not to cheat and go across the line. I'm not just talking about relationally. You might have to leave some things behind and be stripped of some things, but you'll be clothed in your purpose and your integrity. Are y'all hearing me? Can I tell you that running is not always a sign of cowardice? When the devil was preaching to Eve at the tree, she could have said, be gone. And he would have been out of here and she could have moved on. But she sat there and listened and she was enticed. Are you with me? So he preaches from out of bounds. But back to the text. I want you to peep this and then we're out of here. Look at this. Bible says, uh, it, going back to Genesis chapter 3, says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's how we know she was close enough to peep it. She sees that it's good for food. And this is it. She's enticed by with the eyes. The devil often preaches to your eyes. You see, preaches to your ears and to your appetite. Oh, come on, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Come on, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. After he's in this place of fasting and Satan comes and starts talking to him about food. But he ministers often to the eyes or to the ears. But look, look at this. So the Bible says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good, delight for the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave son watch this to her husband who was with her when i used to read this story i used to think eve was like da, 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 da. she's like red, little red riding hood just kind of skipping through the forest and then the devil's like Psst, eve eve and then she's like oh my gosh what do i do and then he's like, yum this fruit, yum this fruit. And I'm just like, and then she ends up going and she eats the fruit. And then she goes, text said she was close enough to see it, that it was good for the eyes. She takes some and she gives it to her husband who was with her. Lord, give us men to cover us. Huh. Adam, you are standing there when Satan is preaching to your wife. From he opened his mouth, he should have said, move from here. But he stood there, watch this. Can I tell you this? Uh, uh, can I tell you this? Adam's sin started with silence. Yes, Eve ate the fruit for herself, but the Bible actually ends up going on and saying that same sin came through Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, for in Adam all die. Romans 5, verse 12 through 15, write that down. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death, what do you mean? I thought Eve was the first one to eat the fruit. Adam is responsible for covering Eve. Come on, somebody. And he was standing by silent while the devil was preaching and enticing her to disobey the commands that God gave him and he passed down to her. Who am I talking to in this place? It is time. God is calling for the men not just to stand by silent. Come on. Sin often starts with silence. There is stuff that God is calling us to stand up for just for the women and children but also to be there to raise our voices against the demonic and satanic attack and the preaching the sermons of the enemy are you with me and so as a result man it's 
through Adam that sin comes into the world. He didn't cover. He didn't stop. He didn't block her in that moment from being able to get there. And yes, she's responsible for herself. But the fact is, men, mandem, God has called us to stand there and to, I mean, to stand up. Not just to stand there, but to stand up. But you know what I love about this? I want to talk to somebody because as a result of Adam's sin, sin passes on to all men. And not only sin and death, the consequences of sin, but also sinful ways. And there are many of you, watch this, I want to talk to a, a men today and I want to encourage you to understand that even in the middle of God's punishment, God is still merciful. And there's someone here today that you, in many regards, may have inherited the actions and the practices of the person that came before you. But even so, God is merciful. Have you heard of Cain and Abel? Cain, Adam's son. Because of the sin that is in his life, he goes, and I'm summarizing, uh, read, uh, if you will, you can read Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. But I want you to peep this. Cain kills his brother Abel, who is also Adam's son. This is all as a result of the sin that was passed down because the man did not, the man did not cover and connect and because the woman disobeyed God in that moment. And as a result of this, I want you to peep this. God, because Cain kills Abel, he punishes him. And the Bible says in, in verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That's where that came. Yo, people be talking. See, talking backwards from the beginning of time. And then look. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's, brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from the, your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. But I love verse 15. Just little hints of God's mercy, man. He says, then the Lord said to him, not so. Did he just punish him? He says, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Yes. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Right. It doesn't mean that what Cain did was right. But I love that we serve a God that even in the midst of judgment and punishment, come on, when we deserve the worst of the worst, can I talk to a man in this place that feels because of your errors, that feels because of your mistakes, that it's over and can we pull the woman them in there too? I want you to know that God is still a merciful God and as long as there is life, there is hope. The fact that you're breathing means that it's not over for you yet. No no matter what you've done, God's mercy is still present. If you would open your eyes and see it. I'm going to help you with this one. Watch. I'm done. Here we are. I'm done. I want you to peep this. Look, look, look. The story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob's, uh, Jacob thieves his brother's blessing. He goes in and fakes like he is his brother who is the firstborn who is supposed to receive the blessing. He sneaks in and his father blesses Jacob with the blessing of his brother. But his blessing was given to someone who didn't deserve it. So this is an unfair situation. But can I tell you that you can bounce back even when things are unfair. Not only is God's present and his mercy present when you are in the middle of mistakes. But I just want to tell somebody that's like, man, it's not fair. I grew up without a dad. I don't have the example. Come on, somebody. Or I grew up with one that didn't show me the love that was necessary. I, I grew up and I had an abusive situation or... You know, I was missing tools or my loved one passed when I was a youngin or 
you know, I didn't grow up with the tools for religion or to manage finances properly. And it might seem unfair, especially when you look at others and see where they're at. Peep this. Genesis 27, 39 through 40, Bible says, Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. That's what it said on Esau, the one who was treated unfairly. You can help me now, sir. Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of the heaven on high. And this is the verse that I've never seen till recently. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, the one who treated him unfairly. Watch this B part. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. He was submitted to his brother because his brother unfairly treated him and received a yoke or a weight that was on him as a result of that which was unfair. But God tells him, even through this, uh, through this blessing and this, this word that was declared over him, even though you've been treated unfair and these things will happen as a result, when you grow restless, you will break that yoke from off of your neck. I don't know who I'm talking today to today. Even if you have not received the example that you think you need for godly fatherhood. I'm here to tell you that you have a father in heaven that can supernaturally break that yoke off of your neck. And heal your heart and give you the strength to be the father that you never had. To be the mentor. To be the man that you never had. And today, I love the fact that even though things were screwed up by the first Adam, the Bible says we have a second Adam. And his name is Jesus. And that even though sin came into the world through the first Adam, that sin comes out of the world through the second Adam. The first Adam caused sin to come to us through food. The second Adam was also tempted by Satan's sermon on food. Turn these stones into bread, he says. Gets him to try to abandon his kingdom. But even though the first Adam failed, the second Adam overcame that temptation. Sin came to the world to the first Adam through a tree. Oh, someone sees where I'm going. But life comes to us. Come on, somebody. Over 2,000 years ago on a tree as well. Come on, what you talking about? An old rugged cross. Come on, somebody. When Jesus came, lived perfectly and took our place to destroy the sins of the first Adam. And they hung him on this old tree, hung him high, stretched him wide. He hung his head and he died. And today, you and I, you have and I have the opportunity to be able to put trust in what Jesus did on that second tree. Come on somebody. And today we can have life eternal. And we can have the strength to be everything that God has called us to be. And so I would be remiss if I didn't do this in this moment. I know uh, these past couple weeks we've been tarrying a little longer than usual. But I just sense God's presence continually in our midst. And I promised God that I'm not going to rush through moments. And even today on this Father's Day, there may be someone here on this Mandem Sunday, a man that's in the house and is like, yo, I need you to pray for me. I want to be the man God has called me to be. I want to be the father God has called me to be. I, I want to just, I just want to surrender my heart and myself to Christ in this moment. God, help me to be a father. Help me to be a husband. Help me to be the mentor. Help me to be 
what you've called me to be. It might be something that's holding you bound. There is, there is freedom for you in the house today. Someone just like, pray for me. If that man is you, can you just, uh, just, just get up out your seat real quick? Won't be long. And just come to this altar and just say, I just surrender myself. I want to pray for you. Yes, sir. Come on. Women, can we celebrate the men as they come? Brothers, can you celebrate your brothers as they come? Come on, you can leave the, the balcony, if you will. Come on, men, if you're like, it's me. I, I just, I need help. I want God to strengthen me. I want God. Come on, can we celebrate them as they come? Come on, celebrate them as they come today. He's here today. He's here today. Glory to God. Come on, come on. Yes respect come on come on come on there's no shame in it there's no shame in it the men are coming today come on saying God we need you we don't have it all together that's okay don't be ashamed we're not ashamed come on the yoke can be broken off come on the yoke can be broken off come on no matter what has happened no matter what things look like glory to God are there any others that will come and for those women that are in the house as the men are still coming come on come on come on Glory to our God. The men are still coming. Come on. Come on. And women where you are, can you stretch your hands towards these men that have come today? And men who are here, can you lift those hands up to, the, to heaven today? I want to pray for you. Come on. They're coming. Glory to God. We are supporting. We are standing. God, today, we cry out to you on behalf of these incredible men. Lord, who you have called, who you have put destiny and purpose in them. Lord, you have called them to lead, to cover, to protect, to be everything that you have called them to be. You know their situations. You know their circumstances. You know what they're facing and what they're up against. And right now, we just in the authority of Jesus' name say not so to every plan of the enemy every scheme where they feel less than where they feel like circumstances are unfair and they feel like they can't make it past where they are Lord we just come against every barrier now remove every barrier break down every plan plot and scheme of the enemy and release of your Holy Spirit to them and we thank you and we give you praise lead them give them wisdom and we thank you and give you the glory and the honor for doing it now in the mighty and precious name of jesus christ we pray somebody say amen come on now men at this altar drop those hands put those hands together come on give god praise men come on open those mouths men and just yell out loud to our god today come on there's freedom in it hallelujah as you go back to your seats, come on, go back praising Him. Go back praising Him. Come on, can we celebrate God and what He has done in our midst today? And men, if you don't know other men in the house, make sure you go up to somebody or people who are a part of our family that you see someone that might not be connected. Connect with someone today. Well, this is the perfect moment, glory to our God, to invite someone today to, re to respond to this gospel that you have heard to experience Christ today if you don't have a relationship with God the Bible says to do sums it up how you're saying how do I begin a relationship sums it up in three things it says repent someone say repent which means to turn from serving yourself your ways your own self and Satan I'm done listening to your sermons devil and we're turning and we're saying we believe someone say believe believe that you died I believe that you rose from death with all power be the Lord of my life and then not only do we believe repent believe and we're baptized and someone today you might have repented and believed but you've never been water baptized you must be baptized you believes and is baptized will be saved we dip you in the water showing that you have left your old life behind identifying you with Christ's death and bring you up identifying you with Christ's resurrection and you're joined with Christ and it's an incredible celebration so if that's you you have never been baptized you have never been baptized or you've been baptized uh, you haven't been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit we have another baptism coming up this coming Sunday come on somebody and we would love to involve and include you in that 
And so, if you, that person is you, and you want to repent, believe, be baptized, or you might be here and you're like, man, I've run away from Christ and I want to come back home. No, you don't have to be rebaptized if you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you meant it. But you can repent and come home today, and there's room at the table for you. Isn't that good news in this place today? So, draw your attention to the connection card on the screen there, or there if you're watching online, or in the seat back in front of you. Do not leave without letting us know if you have made a decision for Christ on today. Glory to our God.